Whispers from Below, a horror podcast by Justin W. Geis. Scary stories, both real and fake. Hello, listeners. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 13 of Whispers from Below, a podcast by a madman, for Mad Men. I'm your resident psychopath, Justin W. Geis, and today's topic of discussion is... The Golden State Killer. Now, before I get into this episode, I have a couple things I want to talk about. Right off the bat, I just want to say, if you guys haven't checked it out yet, please, please, please go check out the Whispers From Below website. It's whispersfrombelow.com. I put a lot of time and effort to it. I think it looks super duper dope. So you should definitely go check it out. There's all sorts of cool merch there. Um, There's a way that you can become a member. You can get updates about the podcast and things that are going on and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to be putting up some stuff soon that's like polls and stuff so we can do some more like interaction between us. You can contact me over there. It's super cool. It's super great. You should definitely go check it out. Um, Secondly, this episode freaked me out a lot. Um, I, it actually threw me into like a minor anxiety attack (laughs) researching, um, because it's like one of my worst fears in the whole world on top of like some of my past trauma, which we like don't need to get into, but like on top of the trauma, there's like a worst fear. So then I was like really paranoid yesterday and like in a full sweat at like noon in 60 degree weather in my apartment. Um, and it was like a whole lot. So I don't think that this episode is going to be completely suitable for people that are younger. Um, I think it's a very fascinating episode, and if you would like to do your own research about it, I do not want to be the product of your scarring as a child. So I'm going to say that if you're a younger listener, this is probably not an episode for you. Um, Some of the things that we talk about in this episode are rape and murder, um, robberies, um, things like that. If any of these are like triggering for you, please, please, please don't listen. Come back next week. We'll probably have something for you then. Um, but this is a case that, um, was in the seventies and got solved in 2020, which I think is fascinating due to like DNA research and things like that. So if you're interested in that, take a listen. Um, but again, if anything starts to trigger you or you start to feel upset, please, Come back next week. We will have an episode for you then, if not next week, the following. Not every episode is for every person, and that's totally okay. So, let us get into the episode. So, we're going to start out with, like, some basic information and then get into, like, his past life, into, like, his plot, sort of plot, like it's a film, into, like, the the narrative of his life. Um, So, the man's name is Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. Very long name. Very Caucasian name. Um, He raped, murdered, and robbed people from 1973 to 1986. Um, At least 13 murders he committed, as well as over 50 rapes and over 120 burglaries. Um, These crimes were solved this year. And when I say 2020, I don't mean like January. I mean like July. Like this pretty much just got solved like, what, a couple months ago? two, like two months ago, they like fully got him behind bars for it. Um, he was arrested in 2018 for it, but the case was like fully solved, done, wrapped up. He pled guilty and everything in 2020, which I think is so crazy that it took us this long to figure out who this was. Um, it's just wild to me. It's, it's really interesting how they did it too. That'll be at the end. So if you're only interested in that part, skip ahead to the end of this episode and just listen to that. Um, So his crimes were spread out, um, and everybody thought that they were different people at first. Nobody thought that it was the same person. So he ended up coining, like, a bunch of different nicknames around the California area until everybody realized that it was one person. Um, And so when he was in San... I'm so sorry if I'm going to say this wrong. San Joaquin Valley, I think, or Joaquin or something like that. Um... He was called the Visalia Ransacker. When he was in Sacramento, he was known as the East Area Rapist. Um, And when he started murdering, he was in the Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Orange Counties sort of area. Um, And he was known as Night Stalker. But what's interesting to note is that later, there was a serial killer named Richard Ramirez. Let me know if you'd like an episode on him. Um, And he was also named the Night Stalker. I believe, I didn't do too much research into him, so I apologize if this is incorrect, 
but I believe that the reason he was called Night Stalker was because he basically copied the crimes of um, D'Angelo. So he was like a copycat. And so they were like, oh, the Night Stalker's back sort of thing. So then he sort of became known as the original Night Stalker. He was like the one, you know, the original, the one and only. Um, this case factored into the establishment of California's DNA database. Um, what that means is that in California, DNA from all accused and convicted felons in California are put into one database so that even if you're across counties, we can make sure that if you committed a crime in Sacramento and then you committed a crime, you know, in San Diego, we know that you were the same culprit in both cases. And then we can track where, you know, if someone's traveling a lot, we can find out. Um, this has been the result of like, trying to figure out how they can solve cold cases and bring everything together. And um, a bunch of cold cases since this DNA database has been created have been cracked because they are able to track cross-county stuff like they weren't able to before. Part of the problem, especially back in that decade and what made it so easy to become, I mean, frankly, made it easy to become a prolific serial killer was this way of like, you could just cross a county and then all of a sudden nobody could find that it was the same culprit because nobody, none of the police departments were communicating with each other. They still don't. Um, but that's, you know, my personal opinion. They, they have a hard time communicating with one another because their egos are so large. And so they don't, they don't get crime solved if you move states, if you move counties, things like that. Um, it makes it much harder to catch you. Um, in 2013, crime writer Michelle McNamara coined the name the Golden State Killer um, to combine all of the crimes because at this point we had learned, I think by like 2001, they had decided that the East Area Rapist and the Night Stalker were the same person and those were all probably linked back to the Visalia robberies. And so she made the Golden State Killer as a general term to sort of encompass all of those magical names that he had been given. Um, now we're going to go into background on Joseph James, which is, I mean, it makes sense how he turned out the way he did. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but you'll see. Um, Joseph James D'Angelo Sr. was his father, um, and he was a sergeant in the army. Uh, Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. Um, was born November 8th, 1945 in Bath, New York. He had two younger sisters and one younger brother. Um, he supposedly witnessed his seven-year-old sister being raped um, by two airmen in a warehouse where they, when they were stationed in West Germany because of his father. Um, and that would explain a lot about his relationship with sex and why it was so violent. Um, because that's kind of what he saw as a kid. And then like that sits with you. I mean, that doesn't just leave that kind of sits with you for a while. Um, after he was convicted, one of his sisters came forward and claimed that he was actually abused by their father. Um, this would make sense. And I'm not trying to, you know, point fingers or anything. There are obviously exceptions to the rule, but especially in that decade with, the wars that were happening and stuff, a lot of soldiers would come home with PTSD and nobody really knew how to treat it. And so they would take out their anger and frustration in, of their own mental states on their children, which is unfortunately why a lot of military members have this um, stereotype, I think is the correct word, that they're all abusive, which is fully not true. I have a brother in the military and I love him very much. Um, and he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. But the problem is that, like, because people in the past did shitty things, now we assume everybody did shitty things. Um, when he was a teen, he had committed burglaries um, and killed a bunch of animals, which is a freaking dead giveaway. I don't know why I censored myself. It's a fucking dead giveaway. Like, there, it's a dead, dead, no pun intended, giveaway. When you kill animals as a kid... And it's like, you're not like a hunter, like that pretty much says you're a serial killer or you're bound to be like, I mean, come on, that's like serial killing 101. Um, he did not graduate high school 
which is interesting. He actually got his GED in 1964, um, and he got it in California, which is where the family had eventually moved to for, like, pretty much his whole high school career. And he did go to high school for, like, I think two or three years, but then decided to get his GED instead so that he could join the Navy in September of 1964. He served for 22 months in the Vietnam War, and in August 1968, he began to attend Sierra College in Rockland, California. He graduated with an associate degree in police science with honors. So this is another thing to note, and I'm going to talk about it. He has, like, I think two, two degrees um, before he becomes, you know, bigger and whatever. Um, but it's interesting to note that he is an extremely intelligent individual. So everything that he does is very calculated and he knows the police system so well because he went to school for it so like he knows how to get away with everything he knows what things they look for like very intelligent man very smart choices um after he got his degree in police science he attended sacramento state university in 1971 and he got his bachelor's degree in criminal justice then he took postgraduate courses at the College of Sequoias in Visalia. And then from there, he did 32-week police internship at the Roseville Police Department before he became a police officer. In May 1973 to August 1976, he was a burglary unit officer in Exeter, which is like a really tiny town. I think it's changed names now. Um, but it's like a really, really tiny, tiny town in California. Um, then he served in Auburn from August 1976 to July 1979. Um, and in July, he was arrested for shoplifting a hammer and dog repellent, which very strange items, I think, in combination, very strange items. Um, he ended up serving six months probation and was fired in October. When he was fired, he threatened to supposedly, allegedly, threatened to kill the chief of police, and apparently stalked his house for, like, weeks. So, this man was a police officer. I'd like us all to just consider that. This man was a police officer. And I'm going to say some other things that happened before he became a police officer that should have been a dead giveaway, that he should not have been allowed to be a police officer. But here we are. This is the country we live in. Um, he was engaged to a woman named Bonnie Jean Colwell, who he met at Sierra College, and this is where this shit gets crazy and why he should not have been allowed to have a gun. Um, they ended up separating because he threatened her with a gun, saying, you have to marry me, you have to marry me, or I'll kill you. Um, and she said, that just doesn't sit right with me. So she diffused the situation and then was like, we're done. That should not be the type of person that is allowed to be a police officer now maybe this didn't word didn't get out maybe she didn't report it um you know things like that um happen all the time and people just don't report it and i you know i totally get that because it's hard to trust the current in the current political climate it is a little difficult to trust the men in uniform right now it's a little difficult and i totally understand that specifically the police it's a little hard um so i get why she maybe wouldn't have reported it but the idea that like a man like that could come off so like sound in mind that he could be quote unquote protecting us is just a really scary thought and it like makes my skin crawl the idea that like they don't do, like, any intense psychological exams to try to, like, figure out if you're safe to be given a gun. Anyway, that's a different topic for a different time. <laughs> um, he ended up getting married to a woman named Sharon Marie Huddle. They were married from 1973, technically, to, like, 2019. Um, but they separated in 1991. And then they finalized their divorce in 2019 but she started to file the divorce in 2018 when he got arrested so they separated in 1991 but like i guess like stayed together for whatever reason which i think is kind of a weird choice 
And then she filed for divorce in 2018, and it was finalized in 2019 before his sentence was given in 2020. I don't know about you, but I personally hate having to go to the grocery store. It takes up so much of my day when I could be starting a new hobby with that time, like soap carving or collecting the sick bags out of airplanes. With Instacart, it makes grocery shopping fast and easy, all while allowing me to stay in my underwear. Instacart allows you to order all of the things you usually get from your local stores, delivered to your door in as fast as one hour. Not only that, but it will also give you smart suggestions for new items based off of your preferences, as well as highlight deals to help you save some money. The shoppers handpick perfect produce and make sure that your eggs get to you safely. You can get free delivery on your first order over $35 by following the link in the show notes. This also lets Instacart know that we sent you, and it helps support Whispers From Below. So if you hate grocery shopping as much as I do, try Instacart today and enjoy getting your groceries the easy way. Um, in the 1980s, we don't really know what he did for work. It's not um, entirely clear what he did for a job in the 1980s. He kind of fell off the face of the planet, which is, you know, suspicious to say the least. Um, and then from 1990 until 2017, which was when he retired, um, he was a truck mechanic at Save Mart Supermarkets in Roseville. Reports say that um, he had extremely angry outbursts and would casually bring up his crimes, which like nobody knew they were his crimes. Um, but like randomly, like when the East Area Rapist stuff was happening, he would casually bring that up in conversation and be like, isn't it crazy that someone's raping all these women? And everyone's like, we were talking about ketchup. What, what do you mean rape? Like, why? I don't, what, what? Like, just very uncomfortable, but he would casually bring it up and want to talk about it, which is suspect. One neighbor said that they actually received a phone message from him um, that said, quote, uh, well, first, he was threatening to, now the quote, um, deliver a load of death, unquote, which was because their bog, their, their bog was darking. Wow. Their dog was barking a lot. And so they were like, yeah, he was like, I'm going to deliver a load of death onto you. Like, what? Who Who do you think you are? Dogs bark. Get over it. It's an it's a aminal. You killed animals as a teen. You really want to st- make it stop barking? You know what to do. Like, I don't know. Not the kind of guy you want being a police officer. But whatever. I don't know what I'm talking about, clearly. <laughs> um... He ended up committing one murder and over 120 burglaries within 20 months in Visalia. Some of these burglary, burg, whoa, oh my God, why can't I speak today? Some of these burglaries, wow, um, actually occurred on the same day. Like he would do more than one on the same day. There was a day um, where he did 12 separate burglaries on the same day. That's crazy. That's an all-day affair. He must have started straight off in the morning and gone all the way till, like, midnight. Like, a full, like, 14-hour workday to get that done. That's crazy. Um, His, like, MO, sort of, he would either vandalize or steal some of the owner's possessions. He would constantly go through women's undergarments. um, But he would only steal, like, coins or low-value items. He ignored high-value items, banknotes, things like that, like really expensive jewelry. He would all ignore that. Even if it was in plain sight, he wouldn't take it. He would take things that were like personally of value to you, like maybe a ring that your grandma gave you. That would be taken. Maybe like a plastic bracelet that your ex gave you and you're in love with him and whatever. That would be taken. But like not your like $4,000 necklace. No, no, no. That would stay, which I think is a really weird thing but i think that that makes you more upset than losing the money because it's like oh yeah i spent a lot of money on that necklace but like whatever but if it's something of like sentimental value if it's personal to you i feel like that stings a little bit more so that's probably why he did it um because he is clearly not mentally sound on uh february 5th 1975 claude snelling who is a journalism, well, was a journalism professor at the College of the Sequoias, um, chased a prowler who was underneath his daughter's window. And for context, um, I use the word prowler a lot in this episode. 
Prowler basically means like someone that's like not necessarily stalking you, but is like on your property without your permission and is sort of like peeking in windows and stuff. But like you don't know them, like they're a stranger, you're not sure who they are. Like Prowler is sort of just like a, a creeper, basically. Um, on September 11th, 1975, Snelling awoke to sounds um, in his house that were really suspect. It woke him up at around 2 a.m., like scuffling, whispers, stuff like that. Um, so then he ran out his open back door to discover a man in a ski mask that was attempting to kidnap his daughter. Um, and when he tried to stop him, the man shot him twice and killed Claude, leaving the daughter and running away and escaping. Claude did die from this. Um, and they did, like, weird, like, hypnosis stuff to try to get the daughter to remember, like, anything at all. Um, but it didn't really lead anywhere, unfortunately. He ended up having a run-in with a cop. Um, he ended up escaping, but just barely. And this happened in December of 1975. And this is where he started to stop his burglary and started to escalate. So after he started getting caught and he was like, I'm just stealing things, this isn't worth it, uh, let's try rape. Um, he moved to Sacramento in 1976 and began raping. He would stalk his victims before raping them, um, sometimes months in advance. Most of his victims um, had seen or heard a prowler on their property before the attack, but sometimes they um, wouldn't hear or see him coming, and then he would just be there. Um, Sometimes he would even enter the homes of future victims to unlock certain windows, unload weapons like guns and things like that in the home. Um, and sometimes he would even plant future ligatures like shoelaces and strings and stuff that he would use to tie up his victims. Or like he, like the towels that he would use to gag them, he would sometimes hide those in drawers around the house um, so that he would have them when he broke in later. So that's a really fun, fun thing to think about. Um... This is where yesterday, like, my skin started to crawl. And I was I was fully with my roommate. Like, I wasn't alone here, you know, and I had the dog and the cat. And, you know, I, I was fully with people. And I just was so freaked out. One of my worst fears of all time is being stalked. Truly, honestly, it is something that terrifies me. Like, the idea of it just, like, makes my skin crawl. And the idea that not only did he stalk people, but not to get into too much detail about my past, but, um, you know, rape is something that is kind of like a little bit of a trigger for me. It's not something I really like to talk about or do a ton of research on. I can watch people get chopped up all day. Um, but for some reason, it feels much more offensive to, like, leave someone alive after you take away something like that from them. Their safety in their own home and things like that. Um... And I just was, like, really going through uh, doing my research yesterday and, like, freaking out. I was, like, fully tweaking out. Had to take breaks. Like, this part really scared me. So just a disclaimer. This The next, like, couple bits of it are, like, a little spooky ooky. Even for me, this is a little spooky ooky. Um, so normally, when he started, he would target women that were alone or with, like, really small children that, like, couldn't do anything about it. Um, but then one day he did it to a couple and he started to get a taste for that and was like, yeah, I'm gonna do that from now on. So he started doing couples. This is the other thing is that that makes you feel so much less safe, even if you're with someone, because if this man can get you, even if you have someone sleeping in the same bed as you, like, how are you going to feel safe ever? You know what I mean? It's crazy. Um, he would awaken the couple with a flashlight and a handgun. He would then tie them both up, normally with shoelaces, and then he would blindfold and gag them with towels that he had torn up. He would normally force the female to tie up the male, um, and he would, you know, yell at her saying, I'll fucking kill you, tie him up, blah, 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 blah. Once he tied, once she tied him up, he would tie her up, and then he would, um, place dishes like stacked up dishes on the man's back and he said that if i hear even one of them rattle i will fucking kill everyone in this house don't you dare move um and sometimes the couples had children um sometimes the couples were living with like friends or sometimes it was just them um but the, the thought of like if i move i die sort of thing he would then take the female into the living room and he would rape her repeatedly sometimes for hours 
he would take breaks in between. He would eat their food. He would drink beers. Um, he would ransack the house and steal things. Sometimes he would just hide and he would wait till it seemed like he had gone. And the minute that she goes to do anything to escape because she thinks he's gone, he would pounce on her again um, and continue raping her and assaulting her. Um, just really... Ugh. It just, like, makes me so uncomfortable. And I'm, like, pretty good. I literally have a podcast about, like, murder. Like, I'm really good at researching stuff like this. But for some reason, this specific one, like, really sent a shiver down my spine. Um, anyway, the ligatures were normally so tight on the victim's hands that the, the hands would be numb for, like, hours after being untied. Um, and then he would, you know, eventually just disappear from the home. He wouldn't give any notice that he had left. He would leave completely silently. So she didn't know if he was lurking in the shadows again. She didn't know if he was in the kitchen, if he was in another room. And they would just wait for hours. Maybe he, maybe he's gone. Maybe he's not. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how much time has passed. I'm sitting here naked. I've been raped. Like, what am I supposed to do? And he would just let them sit there while he escaped. I think, honestly, that's the worst part about all of it, is he doesn't even give them a definitive, like, all right, I'm fucking leaving. Bye. Like, there's no... There's no way for them to know that their night of terror was over. There was no way for them to know that that was done. Um, and I think that's honestly one of the worst, worst parts about it was that they continued to sit in that fear for so long. Even though he wasn't even there. He had left, but they didn't know. And so they're sitting there like... The husband's like, I can't move or I'm going to kill her. And oh my God, I can't believe this is happening and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, I can't move or he's going to pounce on me again. And I don't want to get raped. If I just stay still, maybe he'll think I'm dead. Like, I just can't imagine being in that situation. That is just truly one of the worst, most awful things I think I've ever heard of slash talked about on this podcast. Do you know someone who likes funky socks? <laughs> well, do I have an awesome new gifting idea for you. Society Socks is a sock subscription that sells funky socks with a social cause. They sell gift subscriptions that allow you to prepay for two pairs of exclusively designed socks to be delivered to your recipient's door for 3, 6, or 12 months. These socks are made of a warm, soft, and comfortable blend of combed cotton, guaranteed to make their feet feel and look great. But why are they called Society Socks? Well. Socks are one of the most needed and least donated clothing items at homeless shelters. Though Society Socks aims to change that. With every pair of socks purchased, another pair of socks is donated to a homeless shelter. On top of gifting awesome socks monthly, you will feel confident that you are actively making positive change in society. With two surprise pairs of socks arriving to their door every month, you can feel confident that you have contributed to the beginning of an awesome sock collection. Visit mysocietysocks.com slash whispers and use the code whispers to get $10 off your first gift subscription. Give the gift of funky socks today. His route of escape changed. Normally he would try to hit houses that were near like parks or schools or something like that so that he could escape um, on foot through the parks and yards. He would normally then get on a bike that he would bike to a car or to his home, um, and that's how he would escape. He raped people from 1976 to 1979. Um, this is when he was known as the East Area Rapist. Original Night Stalker began murdering in 1979. Um, though his first intended victims escaped, he wasn't the best at murdering. He's a very smart man. He's very good at what he does, clearly. Um... But yeah, not so good with the not so good with the killing. Better with the with the with the with the rape and the and the stealing. Not so good with the the killy killy. Um women uh were always raped before murder. Um and then they were murdered by bludgeoning or gunshot. Once he started murdering people, he began this like written and telephone correspondence. So he would write letters and he would also call the police and local news stations and stuff. Um, and he would say things like, this is where I'm going to strike tonight. Hope you're there. Um, the police uh, ended up finding a map once. So someone had reported like a suspicious vehicle had been parked here last night. We're not really sure whose it is. Um, 
but it's never been here before and we're a little a little spooked out by it. And so they checked out the spot the next morning um, when they got told that there was a vehicle there and they found some papers scattered around, one of which was a map where um, the map was completely hand-drawn and it said punishment over the top of it. Nobody could ever locate the area that the map was drawn of. Um, so a lot of psychiatrists have sort of agreed that it was like his ideal hunting ground. Like he drew a map of like where he would ideally want people to live so that he could rape and murder them. Like it was sort of like his like, this is my, this is my dream. This is my heaven of where I want people to live. Um, cause it'll be easiest to kill him that way. He would make phone calls saying, I'm going to fuck again tonight. You guys can't catch me. Um, and then the crimes would be committed that night. So they were like, it's definitely him unless he's working with somebody else. Um, but they could never like trace the calls enough, things like that. He ended up actually calling like a therapist and was like, I need help. I am Night Stalker and I don't know what to do. Like I'm the East Area Rapist. I don't know what to do. Like I need help. And then like, as they talked for a little bit, he was like, you're tracing this call. And then like hung up, which is... Oh, oh, scary because it proves that he's not insane. He genuinely knows that what he's doing is not correct and he's continuing to do it because he doesn't have what? Self control. Good answer. Good answer. Um, yeah, the, the final call that he ever made um, was on April 6th, 2001. It was to a previous victim and all he said was, Do you remember when we played? Which, like, can you imagine getting a call from the man that raped you for, like, an entire evening for hours on end, stole things from you, broke into your home, saying, like, do you remember when we played as though it was, like, a game? Like, fuck that guy. What an asshole. Like, that's not okay. That's just, a, that makes it nine times worse. Like, for some reason, that makes it so much worse in my brain than just leaving the night and letting the night be that night. You bring it back up into her brain. Fuck you. After this, the, the case ended up going cold for a while before some DNA evidence had surfaced and linked the original Night Stalker to the East Area Rapist. And so they knew that those the East Area Rapist was the buildup to the Night Stalker crimes. In June 2016, the FBI released more info about the Golden State Killer, as well as a $50,000 reward for them if they knew anything about them. This is where the episode goes from disturbing to fascinating. So the way that they caught him, I think is so cool. And I, I had never really heard of this before. Um, it makes sense, but the amount of time and energy that had to have gone into this is, I mean, wild. Wild is probably the best word to use. They created a genetic family tree based on the DNA that they had collected from the crime scenes that went all the way back to the 1800s. It's a very long time ago. Um, they started eliminating suspects from the tree. So they would go like, okay, this tree branches off and now they're all tan. Okay, done. Now, okay, so this tree branches off, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now they're all women, done. Like, based on age, gender, well, age, biological sex, based on um, ethnicity, based on physical bone structure, on looks, on all this sort of stuff, on certain genes that were def definitely needed to be there, certain things in the DNA that had to be there. They started eliminating all of these family trees until they finally, finally got to D'Angelo, and he was the only possible option left. So this must have taken, like, years to do. But I think that that's a really interesting way to sort of go about finding someone. They were so desperate to figure out who it was that they were like, all right, let's start from scratch and just sort of like went from there. Like, that's crazy. The amount of time that that must have took. I mean, come on. Um, he wasn't their only suspect. Um, they had a couple other suspects that ended up getting cleared through DNA stuff or whatever. And over the years, of course, they had suspects that all got cleared because of alibis, DNA, things like that. But finally, on April 24th, 2018, a Sacramento County Sheriff deputy arrested D'Angelo. 
He was charged for eight counts of first degree murder, and they ended up adding four additional counts of murder on top of that. They had gained DNA surreptitiously. That's the word that was used in the article I was reading. And I was like, wow, what a, what a, what a fancy word. I think I'll use that. Uh, they say surreptitiously gained uh, DNA from his car and from a tissue that he had thrown out. And it matched the Golden State Killer DNA. So they knew that they had the right guy. He ended up pleading guilty and admitted to all of the rapes and the murders and kind of talked about the burglaries. And they were like, oh my God, you were the burglar too? Like, Jesus Christ. And so they all kind of connected, came into fruition, and all of it started to become clear. The robberies were a way of him learning how to break into people's homes. It was a way of him learning how to control a house from the inside out. Then he started raping. It was his way of getting his sexual uh, fantasies fulfilled. It was his way of getting his jollies off. Um, and then once that started to not be good enough, where did it escalate to? Murder. It's like a pretty typical story. His just took a long time and he was very calculated with it. Normally with serial killers, you'll see an escalation from rape to murder, um, especially if it's a sexually driven sort of killing thing. Um, but what's interesting to note is that that normally is like over the span of like a year or like months. Not like years, not like multiple years of committing the same crime. Like, I will say to his credit, he has a lot of self-control and he's, you know, clearly good at what he did, which I shouldn't really, you know, honor this man or value him in any way. But I mean, no one can deny that he's extremely intelligent and clearly did a good job at what he did because he didn't get caught for years and years and years and years and years and years. And years. Um, but the only reason he pled guilty was to save himself from the death penalty. He ended up getting charged for 13 murders and 13 cases of kidnapping. Um, no chance of parole. Multiple life sentences. Um, during the trials and stuff, he kept stating that his inner voice, Jerry, made him do it. And that he felt sorry and didn't want to do any of those things. But Jerry was a part of him. And he couldn't get rid of him. And he didn't want to get rid of him. Now... This is where I don't believe him. For the sole purpose of, he is too smart, in my opinion, to be, like, fully on the brink of, like, having an inner voice tell him what to do. In cases where you see things like that, they are not as intelligent. They are not as well you know well spoken as well educated as him he's clearly a smart man he had two degrees you know he lived a long life escaped his crimes for a very long time and probably would have gotten away with it had we not gotten better with our dna technology um and i think that this was a way of him trying to reconcile with the world it was his way of being like no 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 i'm a good guy see when we all fully know that he isn't. It was his way of sort of trying to lessen his gruesomeness, his disgustingness, his brutalness in the eye of the public. He knew he was still going to get charged because they basically had a sound case against him. Um, but what's interesting is that you sort of see him, from my perspective at least, my, my two cents, you see him sort of be like... Uh, a very sly person backed into a corner and he starts to just like it's like when you like a like in all the things where like the snake is like backed up in the corner and then it like kind of like slithers and hisses its way out it's kind of what he was trying to do like no 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 i'm just crazy it was jerry it wasn't me like all right maybe that's true but we're at the point now where like I think you're you're far too intelligent for jerry to have any control over you because jerry is not the intelligent one in your brain. You are. You're the one that ended up doing the things. Jerry was just like, rape that girl. You could have been like, I'm going to go see a therapist and get this figured out, but you didn't. You gave into it, and you were smart enough to be able to do it, and you were angry enough to do it. So, I don't know. That's pretty much all I have on this crazy, crazy man. Um... This this man is still in prison. I mean, he just got there this year. So he's still there, still locked up, which is good to know. Um, but this is one of those fascinating moments where 
something that was considered a cold case for years and years and years and years, an unsolved crime that people love to research and try to speculate and blah, 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 is now solved. And while that's very, I mean, this is where it's like, it's a little bit of like a, not even like a catch-22, but I can't think of another word to describe it, but in the sense of like, it was so infamous for being this, you know, the Golden State Killer was so infamous for getting away. It's like the Zodiac Killer, so infamous for getting away. But the crimes he did, like, while they were truly awful, um, he only really killed, like, 13 people compared to, like, Bundy, Gacy. I mean, Gacy murdered, like, what, 36 people? Same with Candyman. He murdered, like, 35 people. If you haven't listened to those two episodes, look at me plugging plug in previous episodes. If you haven't listened to Candyman, I think that was my second episode I ever did. Um... Go check that out. And if you haven't listened to the John Wayne Gacy episode that was earlier this season, please go check that one out as well. My serial killer episodes are really fun to do. Um, but it's just interesting. Like, he didn't kill that many people, but it was the things he did before it that made him so infamous and so so smart, so interesting. But now that he's caught, it's like, well, you're just another guy that got caught. You know, I mean, he's not because clearly it took us, what, 30 plus years to get him in prison you know it's wild well more like closer to like 40 probably like 40 45 years to get him in prison for what he did um but just interesting to note like i wonder if this is going to be a case like years from now that people even look at or is this just going to be another example of you know not every case is completely unsolved you know, like there are some cases that people go back to years later and they get solved and it's crazy, but then like it sort of loses its appeal to the public eye. Those people like us who love this true crime, this unsolved moment, once it's solved, it kind of removes the mystery from it. I wonder if this is going to become a less popular story, a less popular serial killer now that he's caught. Or is that going to make it more important because it took 45 years, but we finally got him? Like, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to sort of see how the populace reacts to him being captured because obviously we're very happy that he is caught and he is in bars i'm not trying to say that that is not accurate i'm very happy that he's behind bars and is is you know um being punished for the things that he did that's obviously very important i'm more just interested in how is the community now going to react to one of their tr their unsolved true crimes being taken away and being solved just an interesting thought to note um, that's, that's pretty much it. So before I go, I just want to say one more time, please go check out the website. It's absolutely amazing. It's awesome. It's super cool. It it really is. I'm very proud of it. I think it looks really, really great. Um, both on mobile and on, um, the desktop. I think it looks really cool. So go check it out. You can become a member there and then, um, you can get cool updates and stuff like that. I want to start adding onto the website some new features with polls and things like that so that we can start interacting more on what episodes you guys want to see from me um, and things like that. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, there's a contact page. You can feel free to send me a message on there. Um, it can be, hey, your podcast is super awesome. Uh, you know, I really like what you do, blah, 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 blah. Cool. It could be, hey, I have a future, you know, idea for an episode what if you did a series on blank or what if you did an episode on blank it could even just be like hey i like the podcast done like any sort of contact is appreciated um another easy way to contact me is via the instagram page that is whispers from below um no spaces no underscores no capitals no nothing it is pretty cool it's pretty poppin we have some cool pictures going up um, I try to post frequently throughout the week so that I give you guys some cool content. Um, I post pictures of merch. I post pictures of myself. Um, I like to keep you guys updated on what episodes are coming out, what episodes aren't coming out. If anything's, you know, happening where something goes wrong and I, I have technical failures, I can't get the episode up. That's normally where I'll post and let you guys know that there won't be an episode that week. Um, so that's a really good way to keep updated with the podcast itself. So please go check that out as well. If you're interested in me or my personal life at all, um, you can follow my personal Instagram, which is J-U-T-I-N underscore geese, like the animal. Um, I mostly lately am just posting <laughs> pictures of me doing makeup and stuff. For those of you that don't know, um, I am genderqueer. I don't really identify as 
any kind of gender. It's not really something that I subscribe to. I used to for a long time because in ballet and things like that, you are kind of forced into gender norms and things like that. Um, and once I left that world, I realized that just that just wasn't who I am. So lately, I've just been posting a lot of pictures of me doing like fun makeup and, you know, my dog. I have a very adorable dog that I post a lot on there. So if you're interested in anything like that, please go check that out as well. Um, that's pretty much it. So remember, the Golden State Killer took 45 plus years to get caught. Rape is 100% not okay. There are no exceptions to that rule at all. And um, wash your hands. Wear a mask. We are still in a pandemic, Karen. You're not special.